Good day to you friends. This is Pastor Doug Carlson from Grace Missionary Church in Zion, Illinois, with another Sunday message in our current series from the New Testament book of James. I'm glad you've chosen to join us today. We begin our study with a look at the benefits of trials in a believer's life. We learn from James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, that we should consider it all joy when we fall into various trials, because they develop endurance in our lives and they lead us on to Christian maturity. And this was the author's opening statement and, and it was a good one. Our text today could be called a second opening statement because it sets the stage for a further theme that will be developed throughout the book, the issue of wealth. If you have your Bibles handy, please open them to James chapter 1 again. James chapter 1 verses 9 through 12 this time as we continue to uh, work our way through the book. You know, there's always been a gap between the haves and the have-nots in society. So a book that talks to real people about real problems would certainly get around to this topic sooner or later. And as it turns out, James gets there sooner. Let's remember, as we begin, that we're talking about real people when we address issues of wealth. It's so easy for us to demonize entire groups of people or to make unfair assumptions about those on, on either side of the economic gap. To help us keep from doing that, we need to follow one truth that, that would guide us in all of our discussion, and that's this. God loves everyone, and he favors no one. God loves everyone. He doesn't love folks more or less based on skin color, pedigree or position, and he's especially unimpressed with how much a person makes or how much they're worth. Proverbs 22.5 says, The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. And the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 15, tells us that it's a perversion of justice to show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great. Those are just two ways of saying the same thing. We shouldn't be partial to the poor, and we shouldn't be partial to, to the great or the rich. I mean, fair is fair. God loves rich man, poor man, the same. Now, James does address uh, both men in today's text, and I'd like us to pray and then dive right into the book of James. God in heaven, we thank you again that we can come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for this wonderful book that you have written that is our guide book for life. We thank you so much that we were able to find topics that are very practical and relevant. They fit right in with what we're going through. In fact, that always seems to be the case. And I pray you'd help us today, Father God, to understand more about wealth, understand about how we should see wealth, how we should see one another um, as we relate to each other in the economies of our time. And I pray, Father God, that you'd help us to have both uh, courage and wisdom as we would look at your word, that we'd make application to our lives, that we would be the better for having spent time together here in our study. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing I want you to see that verse 9 gives us is that poor believers won't always be down. Poor believers won't always be down. The verse goes like this. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. Now, even though the poor are marginalized and often oppressed in modern society, God has a special place in his heart for them. There are many verses in Scripture that we could give to, to make this point. I'd like to give you just this one. Proverbs 14.31, which says, Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. You know, there were a lot of poor people in James' audience. And by poor, I mean destitute, penniless, impoverished. In every society, in every age, there are people on the fringe, barely eking out a living, unsure of their future. Jesus once said to his disciples, The poor you will have with you always. And of course, he was right. And these folks don't have it easy. So verse 9 would, would get the attention of the poor people in James' audience. Imagine if you're one of these destitute people and the letter comes from the Apostle, uh, the Apostle James and 
right off the, the bat, a priority is given to a, a situation that's very real to you. And he says that the, the lowly believer, the brother in Christ, should glory in his exaltation. Now, lowly, they would understand. They've been at the bottom of the barrel, and they know all too well how humiliating this can be. So a promise of being exalted would cause quite a stir, because it's not what you'd expect. And they would certainly be filled with questions. What does that mean? When, when will this happen? And so on. Now, in this case, the word lowly speaks of an economic destitution, though the word does not exclusively do that. It's found in other contexts throughout the New Testament. But we know that it's speaking of economics here because it's contrasted with verse 10 with the rich. And so, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. So, obviously, in this case, lowly is the opposite of rich. It is poor. Now, this is a believer in Christ. James calls him a brother, and that shouldn't surprise us either. There are many believers among the ranks of the poor. And it also shouldn't surprise us that God cares about this group of people. There are more than 300 references to the poor in Scripture. By comparison, the Bible talks about homosexuality only seven times. So, being lowly financially is a, is a common thread in the Bible. Jesus himself was born to a lower-class family. He was uh, from a backwater, unimpressive town. His birth was announced to humble shepherds working the graveyard shift on the hills outside of Bethlehem. His father was a, was a, a working man, a carpenter. And it was the common, hard-working people of the day that were his natural base. They heard him gladly. They welcomed his discourses. They recognized that there was something different about him, and they were the majority of his converts. In fact, one of the principal marks of the arrival of God's kingdom that Jesus uh, announced was the preaching of the gospel to the poor. I'm going to ask you to hold your place here and turn to the gospels, the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. Very important verses. Really, as Jesus was setting the stage for his entire ministry. This is toward the beginning then. And he, he's gone to the synagogue and he's handed um, the Old Testament scriptures. Luke chapter 4, verses 17 to 19. He's going to be reading there from the book of Isaiah. But the quotation is here for us in Luke. Let me read then uh, Luke 4, verses 17 to 19. And Jesus was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, back in James, then, um, recognizing that Jesus came to the least and the last and the lost, we see a, a reversal of fortunes in verses 9 and 10 that I've read for you because the believing poor are promised exaltation and the believing rich are promised humiliation. Uh, poor Christians should glory in their coming elevation. Glory means to delight, to, to boast in with a, with a godly pride. So the first thing we see in its welcome news is that the poor won't always be down. They are in this life, but they won't always be in that condition. The second uh, point, then, is that the rich believers won't always be up. And that's in verse 10 that I read for you, as well as verse 11, which we'll add in a moment. Now, in this life, we know that the rich have incredible advantages. But this life won't last forever. In fact, later in the book of James, just a page over here, if you turn there with me, chapter 4 and verse 14 James 4:14. 4, uh, James makes a very important statement about life for all of us. Verse 14, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Even if it's 60, 70, 80 or more years compared to eternity, it's just a, a, a whisper. It's just, it's just a vapor. And though it seems then during this time like the wealthy have it made, they also have a temptation to abuse their position and a tendency to put their trust 
in their riches instead of in God. Now consider the case of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus one day asking him what he needed to do to enter heaven, to, uh, to be with God. <clears throat> the story is told in Matthew 19. This is what the Lord told him. Go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Now, why did Christ target the man's wealth? Not because money is wrong, but because his love of riches is what was keeping him from commi committing himself to Christ. It could have been anything else, but for him, his idol, his, his cause for living, the most important thing to him was possessions and money and, and things. So the scripture continues, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. This is a key part, because he had many possessions. He, you know, if the Lord said, give away everything you have, and he didn't have much at all, he probably would have gladly done it. But the Lord zeroed right in on the one thing that was most important to him and said, you need to give up that because you can only have one God and your God is gold. And so he, he says here, he had many possessions and Jesus turned to the disciples and said, assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that was a shocking statement to his followers because in early Judaism, wealth was seen as uh, proof of God's favor. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who believe that today as well. And it's, it wasn't right then, it's not right now. It's not, it's not biblical. But they were saying, if it was difficult for a rich man to get into the kingdom, how could anyone hope to do so? And the answer is only by Jesus, right? O only Jesus can do that. And that's the rest of the story. Jesus said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. People who have it all are easily tempted to think that they don't need the Lord. But as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and, and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one, he will cling to that one and, and despise the other. And he said this, you cannot serve God and wealth. A choice has to be made. And as with the rich man who came to Jesus, the more you have, the harder it is to let go. How much better to be poor in things, but rich in faith, as James chapter 2 talks about. Let me read verse 5 from that next chapter, kind of borrowing from a future message. I can't wait to get into that in more detail, but let's just read it together because it's, it's an important verse at, at this juncture. Uh, James 2 verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? So there you have it. it you can be um, rich in faith or you can be rich in, in possessions. And, um, and again, you could, you could have possessions and still have faith. But the problem here is that most people who have lots of stuff um, don't feel like they need God. And they would just call out to him when they, when they lose stuff. I mean, in their whole life, they've been able to buy what they wanted. If they need it, they buy it. But that's not how it works with eternal life, and that's not how it works with the future. Now, I want you to see that the, the, the guy in verse 10 in James chapter 1 is also a believer. Now, the word isn't given for us. It doesn't say he was a brother, but the sentence construction makes this clear because the two are being compared and they're being contrasted. So in verse 9 it says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. So the words brother and glory are not found in verse 10. But obviously we know he's saying, Let the rich glory in this, uh, the poor, and let the rich glory in this other thing. And so I believe it's very clear that he's saying, Let the poor brother glory in exaltation, and let the rich brother glory in humiliation. It makes sense by the construction of, of the words themselves. But it also makes sense because who would glory in humiliation? I mean, these are both children of God. One is dirt poor and one is filthy rich, but, but they're both depending on the, the grace of God. And, and nobody in their right mind, if you're not a believer, would take delight and pride in humiliation and deprivation and loss. So obviously a rich unbeliever wouldn't do this. He couldn't do this because 
his money is all he has. Money and what he thinks it buys for him. But Christians, on the other hand, no matter how much you make, are not defined by their riches. They are not defined by their possessions. They are not defined by anything but by Christ and faith in him. And so rich believers are depending on God's grace for salvation, just like poor believers are. And so he's saying <clears throat> to the rich believers, things are going to change someday. Physical wealth is temporary. It'll pass away like the flowers of the field. And that's the rest of verse 10, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. Verse 11, let's read that one now. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. The attractiveness of wealth is simply doomed to perish, as are those who are trusting in it instead of trusting in God. Now, true believers know this. They accept it. They appreciate it because they agree that life for believers is, is like living at a campground on our way to a mansion. Now, I realize that the, the rich believers are glamping on the RV side of the park, while the poor are over there on the leaky tent side. But either way, we're all strangers and pilgrims passing through here on our way to our eternal home there. And that's the great equalizer. The, the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. You come to Christ the same, whether you're rich or poor or somewhere in between. And then as we come to Christ, we recognize that we're depending on the same thing. Some will always have more, some will always have less. But faith in Christ is the important thing. That's why rich and poor believers should listen to Jesus when he says in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, and this is a key passage, very familiar but very important, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break through and steal. And this is the key part, right? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is not just for rich people because poor people can still be thinking about laying up treasures down here and they're focused totally on getting more and getting ahead. And maybe they're jealous of their rich. And maybe they're, um, you know, trying to get in the, in the good graces of those who have uh, wealth because all they think about is the present time. So either way, the treasures need to be laid up in heaven because where our treasure is tells us what's important to us, where our heart is. 1 Timothy 6, 17, again, shows that the rich people have a greater temptation here. It says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be proud, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So poor believers rejoice in trials because of the coming abundance. It's going to get better. Rich believers rejoice in trials because they remind them of what's really important. If they lose it all down here, they have the most important thing still ahead of them as well. Neither material possessions nor lack thereof are of any ultimate consequence compared to eternity. So the first thing is poor believers won't always be down and rich believers won't always be up. But in the meantime, both should focus on being faithful to Christ, which, as we mentioned last week, is, is, a, is a key uh, focus and theme of the, the, the entire book. Because for both rich and poor believers, it's the enduring of trials joyfully that proves their spiritual birth. So there's a beatitude that, that finishes the, the, the brief text that we've chosen today, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So blessed is the man. He's, in verse 9, there's the, there's the uh, poor believer. In verse 10, there's the, the rich believer. But in verse 12, it's both and all have this promise that are given to them, um, this wonderful promise in verse 12. So, if rich and poor and all of us in between endure temptation joyfully, as we saw in the beginning verses, we have this promised, promised result. Now, let me remind you of the earlier verses 2, 3, and 4. My brethren, 
Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Do you remember that from a whole week ago? Right? Verses 2, 3, and 4. The word trials is very important to us here. Because the word trial in verse 2 is the same word temptation in verse 12. Um, the word can be used in a either negative or a positive connotation. It depends on the context. And God tests or tries the heart of the poor by giving him less than others. At the same time, he is testing the heart of the rich by giving him more. But God is administering the test. He loves both equally. He wants both to, to pass. These things are for our good. Because we already saw in verses 2 through 4 that a joyful endurance of whatever trials, the various trials of life, produce endurance and bring us to uh, Christian maturity. Now we see in verse 12 that they also bring us this promise of um, the crown of life, which is a, a really interesting expression all by itself. So in each case, that the genuineness of faith is the goal, as each person does what he should with what he has been given. And you know the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. To whom little is given, little is required. But each of us is to be faithful as stewards, as those entrusted with the abilities, the gifts, the talents, the possessions, the money, the all those things. Um, it isn't how much we have, it's how faithful we are with what God has given to us. Now, poor people who become envious and bitter demonstrate a lack of faith and spiritual immaturity. Rich people who become arrogant, proud, and ruthless show that they've forgotten uh, who gave them wealth in the first place, and they're acting in spiritual immaturity as well. So what James is doing now is bringing both of them together into the combined um, churches, the diaspora, the dispersed ones, the scattered ones, and, and, and to us as well by application, leaving us with a message of hope by, by mentioning this crown of life that's awaiting us if we're truly saved. Now it says crown, it's actually more of a wreath than it is a crown, it's speaking more of an athletic uh, analogy than, than royalty. And the phrase literally means the crown that is life more than the crown of life. Now that changes things for us, doesn't it? This is a reference to eternal life itself. He's saying the crown is the life that God has promised to those who trust in him. Now, joyfully enduring trials doesn't earn us salvation because nothing does. But joyfully enduring trials provides proof of the salvation we already possess through faith in Christ. And so we are heading to glory. There's a place reserved for us in heaven. Christ has gone to prepare a place for us. He will come back and take us there to be with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that's a, an amen promise from God. But we haven't received the fullness of that everlasting crown yet. And so that's, that's always out there. That's why... We've mentioned in other messages recently that, that Paul said, I reckon that the suffer sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. In Romans 8, 18, he says that. And so, yes, we're all up against it, and some worse than others, right? And we're all going through things. And, and uh, you might say, but I wish I could worry about the things rich people worry about. I, I, I hear you, but they do worry about things. And they have concerns, temptations, and tendencies that that we don't have, or not, uh, and not as often or as easily to fall into. But either way, this life is not all there is, my friends. As wonderful as life is compared to glory, this is, this is nothing. We have something far greater ahead of us. It has nothing to do with our financial standing. It has nothing to do with which side of the track we were born on. It has nothing to do with how we look or sound. It has nothing to do with which region of the country we're from, or our age, or our gender. We are trusting in Christ. And so, <laughs> we have great things to look forward to. And as we are faithful to the Lord, it provides evidence along the way that we belong to Christ. That we have been given this everlasting life, which will be given to us then in, in fuller ways, in, in its fullness, um, when we get to glory. So, how we deal with trouble then shows whether or not our faith is real for believers of any income level. So, which is better, wealth or poverty? And I'm not asking you which you'd rather be, rich or poor. I, I think I know 
probably what the answer would be for most uh, people. The question I'm asking is, which position is better, wealth or poverty? Which is more spiritual? Which is more close to God? So what, who does God care about the most? What, what's the best thing to be? And, and the answer is, it doesn't really matter. God loves us the same whether we're rich, poor, or in between. God wants to see our station in life as his perfect will and to work, to work within the parameters and the limits that he's given to us. You know, there's a guiding principle about this in 1 Corinthians 7.20. Let me share that with you. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Now in scripture, when, when it talks about our calling, it's referencing our salvation. So Paul is saying that if we were saved as a poor person, listen, this is important, if we were saved as a poor person, we shouldn't be bothered about our impoverished situation. And if we were saved as a rich person, we shouldn't be impressed with our abundance because that's just where God found us. That's where Christ brought us to himself. No, we're not frozen in that. Things can change, right? But we, we shouldn't say, well, I'll serve God when I have more money. Or, I'm going to keep most of the stuff. I'm not going to tithe because I don't make as much. The principles and the commands in Scripture are for all of us. And so don't play this game. Don't get into a class warfare. Because if Christ saved you in this condition of, of, impoverish, of poverty, then that's how he wanted you. He brought you to himself. Maybe if you were rich, you wouldn't have come to him. And if you're rich when, when God brings you to himself, then you need to see that as a chance to use your wealth for, for God. But there shouldn't be bitterness and envy and strife and, 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 and all those things. It, it doesn't belong in the Christian church. So what we're seeing here is that we should just live out our God's calling in our life in the condition in which we were saved and never use our status as an excuse to stop serving him or to cop an attitude of discontent. Wealthy Christians, here's the message. Live for Jesus. Poor Christians, here's the message. Live for Jesus. There's a wonderful place in the book of Philippians that most of us know, and we could quote at least part of this, but I'd like you to hold your place here and turn to Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. Right? Some of you know already where I'm going. Um, great passage. Um, convicting, but, but real life, because we've we've been here. I think we could all relate to some degree to what Paul is saying here in Philippians chapter 4 verses 11 to 13. May I read those for you? Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is not a verse for wealthy Christians only. That is not a verse for well-connected Christians, Christians with positions. That is a verse for all Christians, for all believers in Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because he saved me the way I am, just as I was without one plea. And so he knows my need. He brought me to himself. What he does in my life is fine with me. And that's, that's what we have to see it as. So in Christ, we're all equal in position, right? And one day, when the poor are raised up and the rich are brought down, we'll be equal in practice as well. And we'll spend eternity enjoying the spiritual riches of glory together. In the meantime, because that's where we're stuck, is in the meantime, may I suggest a biblical prayer that will help keep you from, from either arrogance on the one side or bitterness on the other. It's found in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 and 8. I love these verses because I, I love the book of Proverbs. But let me just share them with you. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 and 8. Two things I request of you. Deprive me not before I die. Remove falsehood and lies fr far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of the Lord. 
Isn't that great? Give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me what I need for my daily existence. Give us this day our daily bread. Neither poverty nor wealth, but just what we need for the moment. Just enough, Jesus. Just enough. That, that should be our prayer. That should be how we live our lives. Just enough. And then may I use whatever you give me for your glory and your plan. And may I rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Because I'm not jealous of anyone. Because my God is the Savior of my soul. And he has given me all the things that pertain to life and godliness. And at the end of this life, in which even with hardships, Jesus is there. And he's given us life more abundant. But even at the end of this life, especially at the end of this life, we have that wonderful home in heaven. And it's reserved for everybody who's trusting in Christ. Oh, how I hope you are one of those. Whatever your economic situation right now, if you're down right now, if you're suffering, lack, a lot of people are today, pray to the Lord. We'll pray for you and ask the Lord to help you. But don't let it affect your attitude because God knows the path that you've taken. He knows what's going on and he can help you. He wants to help you. And if you're wealthier today, hey, can I give you some advice from Scripture? Give some of that away, will you? Don't do it for a tax write-off. Well, do it if you want, but that's not the only reason. That's not the main reason. See who you can help in Jesus' name today. Use your wealth for the kingdom of God. Don't depend on it. Don't think you're better because of it. Don't abuse the position that wealth has gotten you. Don't think you're something when you're not, because God is all and in all. And you and me, hey, we're just, we're just plain folk, made in the image of God for a purpose, but nothing in ourselves to brag about. Well, I think this sounds like a good thing to ask, don't you? Proverbs 30, 7 and 8, and a great way to live. So I'm going to ask that this would be your prayer for the coming week, and to be honest, for the rest of your life. Maybe you could um, look up that verse, maybe put it on an index card or something, and take a look at that on a regular basis. That's one of the things I have found to be very helpful. Well, my friends, we're done for this uh, uh, part, this message from the book of James. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you again next week and continue to walk with the King today and be a blessing.